Holy Spirit, when I am weak, then you are strong. And so we glory not in our strengths, but in our weaknesses, because it causes us to put a dependency upon the Holy Ghost to be the preacher of the Word. And I pray that you would use these simple words this morning in a powerful way to impact your church in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. The title of my sermon this week, folks, is No Other God Has Such Great Power to Save. What's that got to do with my sermon? Very little, but I read it in the Bible this week and it just stirred my heart the whole week. So I just have to share that with you. So uh, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to share one or two keys uh, because that's why we called the key church. So I'm going to give you one or two keys because we're busy trusting God for breakthrough. We're busy trusting God for revival. So we're going somewhere. We're not just randomly teaching here and there. We're busy building the walls of the city so that the people can be safe and secure and they can serve their God in peace and we can see the kingdom of God explode in the earth. God's plan is for us to live in a walled city, spiritually speaking. I don't really want you to have to have big walls uh, around your house. You can if you want to. Uh, stop the wind, many other things. But um, I'm speaking spiritually. Rebuilding the walls around your life. Because if there's no wall in the spirit realm, the enemy gets in. So, um, in the King James Version, Daniel 3.29 says, Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. That's where I got the title of my sermon, folks. There is no other God that can deliver after this sort. I, I, as I'm speaking now, may somebody just be strengthened. May somebody be encouraged in their inner man. There is no other God that can deliver. So you might think you're in a deep hole and your situation is, uh, is very serious, but there is a God in heaven who is well able to deliver. In the message it says it like this. There's never been a God who can pull off a rescue like this. I'm telling you folks, one of the greatest rescue movies I've seen was Radon and Tebby, where they flew so many miles to go and rescue those hostages. What a brilliant story it is. What a miraculous recovery it was. So few people lost their lives. It, it was only God. But even that is nothing compared to our God. If you're needing rescue, there is a rescuer in heaven. And he wants to rescue you from your situation. <coughs> so I've given it now to you in the King James, in the message. Now you're going to get it in the CEV. No other God has such great power to save. Is there anybody that's needing saving? Whether you're needing salvation to get to heaven or whether you're needing uh, salvation or saving from your circumstance or your situation, you can think that your situation is hopeless. My God specializes in hopeless cases. That's his speciality. If they put a title on his door, they could say he specializes in the impossible. Yes. I want to just share with you uh, uh, an answer to one of my prayers. Um, since I had COVID for the second time, I really was struggling to recover. I, I must say, I, I give God thanks this morning that in this last week or so, I have vastly improved. 
And so I'm grateful to God for that. And uh, I, I feel strengthened in my body today, even as I preach. Guys, you don't understand. Sometimes I stand here and I just hope I'm going to make it till the end of the sermon because of uh, the attack of the devil against my body. Today I feel a bit stronger, praise God. And so I was praying, Lord, you know I need a holiday. And so Rona was going on uh, the computer, wiki deals and all these things. Uh, how many of you know about wiki deals? You can get stuff real cheap, but often we call it, the, when we get there to this hotel room, we say, is this a wiki deal or is it a wiki dud? Okay. <laughs> Uh, and so we've been looking so that we could get away. I didn't even pray about it, folks. And then one of my friends phoned up and he said, Nick, I'm going to Israel for a month and my penthouse is going to be vacant. You know where the key is. It's in the letterbox. Just pull into my pad. His flat has got the best view of the sea in Seapoint, bar none. There isn't a better one, okay? When you stand in his lounge, unless you really look down steep, you can see there's a little road there. Otherwise, all you see is sea. You feel like you're on a ship. And if you lie in bed and you just turn your head to the side, you look down the full length of the Seapoint Beach. I, I, I want to tell you that God is well able. Uh, and I can just imagine somebody's right now saying, that's not fair. Pastor's going on holiday. What about me? Nothing like that ever happens to me. Luke 6, 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall they give into your bosom. For with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Rona and I sent our pastor on many holidays. Pastor John and Auntie Helen. And we had points at Mykonos and whatnot, and we were always looking to bless them. Pastor John, don't you want to take a little break and take a midweek at Mykonos? And uh, guys, I'm not very good with uh, board meetings. I hate board meetings. My memories back of those days, now I'm talking many years ago, we'd sit in the board meeting and Pastor John would say, Guys, I'm really tired. I'd like to just break away for a week or so. And somebody would say, Pastor John, you always go on holiday. They're just joking, but it's just ugly. It's just an ugly spirit, man. My spirit was, Pastor John, that's wonderful. I'll pay for your holiday. So, so we sowed holidays, folks. So now I'm not surprised when God gives me, you know, we gave him... Uh, points at Mykonos, but God gives us like one of the best flats in Seapoint. I don't even want to tell you how many millions that flat is worth, okay? Millions and millions and millions. Because God is good like that. And He wants to bless you. He said, Pastor, I'm not blessed. Well, maybe there's a reason. You know, I believe only heaven will reveal the success of the courts of the Lord session that we held. But some of the situations that we prayed about only got worse. You might be one of those situations. I want to tell you folks, the battle is real. Sometimes before it gets better, it gets much worse. Okay? But something is moving Something is shifting. One of the things that Rona and I brought to the courts of the Lord is our daughters. We want them to be on fire for Jesus. So, my youngest daughter does court-ordered supervisions. Now, she, uh, she goes with maybe the husband to visit his daughter or his son because he's not allowed to see the child on his own. There has to be a psychologist present. And then they take the child to the beach or 
to the restaurant or whatever. So it's a real tough life. It's a hard job, they say. You've got to sit on the beach and watch a child play, or you've got to sit in the restaurant and eat. And, but then eventually what happens, the court case is finalized, and they read a report and say, no, this is, besides what the mother says, this is a good father. He's very good to this child. Uh, and then she shoots herself in the foot because then the court says, okay, now he can see the child on his own. So she then loses that gig, so to speak. But she got a new gig in the week. And so she sent us a message on our family group. She says, mom and dad, are you behind this? Because these people uh, want to go to church on a Sunday morning as a family. And now I have to be in church this morning. <laughs> And she's getting paid 300 rands an hour to sit in church, folks. <laughs> Plus traveling time. You can't make this stuff up. I'm telling you, if God is for you, you can't even dream this stuff up. If God is for you, who can be against you? So I'm going to quickly share a key with you. What happens to land that does not allow the spirit of Elijah, the passing on of the anointing from a spiritual mentor to spiritual disciple to operate in it? That's a question. What happens to land? What does the Bible say? Malachi 4 verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of Jehovah come, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. I want you to know that where there's not this proper relationship between father and son, then your land is cursed. Because, folks, we're busy building the walls. We're closing every gate that's been left open. We're going to the courts of the Lord and saying, uh, Lord, we need a judgment in this regard. We need your help. We want to do everything in our power to build the walls around the saints so that their home is blessed, their family is blessed. But you can go to the highest court of the Lord and you can pray the most beautiful, eloquent prayers you want to pray. If the relationship between father and son is not right in your home, then your land is cursed. I'm just telling you what the Bible says here, guys. Write it down, Malachi 4 verse 5. I put it in bold. Lest I come and smite the earth, the earth with a curse. What is happening in places like Lavender Hill, Hanover Park, the place is cursed, man. You can see it. There's gangs running wild. And, and there's no relationship between father and son. Okay? And the revival that I'm praying for in this church, you get many revivals. Many, you can get a healing revival, a laughter revival. The revival that I'm praying for is for relationships between father and son between mother and daughter. A land that does not see the passing on of anointing from a spiritual mentor to a spiritual disciple, it's cursed. And folks, the church is full of it today. There's very little of uh, fathering. and Because the people been in church years, they know everything. What does the pastor know anyway? Man? What was e Elisha's reaction when he saw Elijah leaving, Elisha didn't say, goodbye, God bless you, have a safe trip. He said, my father, my father. He realized that wasn't his father. What's he talking about? He still wanted to have a bright place with his family before he went with Elijah. They had a groot braai vlees. A couple of oxen, you know, that's a big braai that, my friend. And all the 
wood that they used to keep these oxen together made good firewood. In other words, you're not going back to that work anymore. Elisha got the revelation that Elijah was his spiritual father, and so he was able to inherit an anointing. Why did Elisha have to recognize Elijah as his father to get an anointing? Elijah could only leave an anointing to his spiritual sons. That's how inheritance works. So if you don't have a spiritual father, you're a freaking orphan. It was only when Elisha recognized Elijah as his father that he was eligible to inherit the anointing from his father. I'm preaching good this morning, folks. I'm telling you, I'm helping somebody. So who is your spiritual father? Or what is your relationship with your earthly father like? You know, and some of you might say, well, my dad is dead 20 years, Pastor Nick, what are you talking? Maybe you need to go and stand on his grave, and I'm not talking about calling up spirits now. I'm not into that stuff. Go and stand on his grave and say, Dad, you know, if I had it to do over again, I would have done more for you. I would have helped you more. I would have loved you more. I would have appreciated you more. Because it's important in the spirit realm. God is interested in family. And where there's a breakdown in family, folks, <coughs> in I love doing marriage counseling because the truth will out. You know, sometimes when I see a guy, he says, Pastor, you know, she's this and that and that and that. And that. But then when I sit with her, she says, yeah, Pastor, maybe that's true, but he did he tell you this, 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 and this? You know, I love doing marriage counseling, but let me tell you, when there's trouble in your marriage, it's like you open the double gate for the devil. Come into my house. Come in, sit on my couch. Everything is wrong. Everything is broken. Nothing will go right. God is a God of family. And, and uh, folks, don't misunderstand me. I get it. Sometimes it can be very difficult. You can be trying your best to try and get your children to hear you. And, to, uh, and some people can just make it extremely difficult. I get it. But because of that extremely difficult... The enemy has a foothold in your house. And, and so you have to do everything in your power to bring about reconciliation. Because even if you lose in the reconciliation, even if you be the least, when they should apologize to you, you apologize to them, now the wall is fixed, the enemy can't come in, and now you're living in the land of blessing. Much better place to live. It's where I want to live. It's where I want to be, in blessing land. King David was thirsty, and he just said a stupid thing. He, he said, you know, I'd love some water from that spring in Bethlehem. You know where the spring is in Bethlehem? It's in the fields of uh, Ruth, where Ruth inherited that land through marriage. Okay? It's called the shepherd's fields. And, and David just mentioned, oh, I would so enjoy, because you know, a spring can be pure, it can be cool on a hot day, just a nice cup of spring water. And he just mentioned, oh man, it's hot today. Wouldn't I enjoy? And that's all he did. And then he moved on and he probably drank some water where he was. But three of his men said, if David wants water from that spring, doesn't matter that that's enemy territory. 
that we have to break through the defenses of the enemy to go and get that water. That's what David gets. And they came back with this water and David realized, you crazy guys, you risked your life. You could have all three been killed. You're going up against the whole army, three of you, just to bring me some water. And there's water here. He said, you mad? I can't drink this. And he poured it out as a drink offering to the Lord. Folks, can I tell you, as a pastor, uh, I, I don't even sometimes uh, just say, oh, I, I would like some coffee or something like that, and then somebody will bring it. I'm talking about, I give a person instruction, would you please do that? No, pastor, I'm not the right person for that. That's not, well, I wouldn't have asked you if I didn't think God said that you're the right person. And people don't want to do what you ask them to do. You want the church to explode. We've got to get that heart right. Folks, we have a problem. Our land is cursed. The land in the city, much of it is cursed. So we need to pray. Because we're not going to accept it, are we? We're going to not just say, okay, well, there's trouble in the land. We're sort of used to it because it's been like this most of our life. So we'll just go, no, folks, we need to pray. Matthew 17, 21 says, But this kind goeth not out save by prayer and fasting. Ouch. Who of you like fasting? Careful now, careful. Careful, you don't know where I'm going with this. Me personally, I hate fasting. You can see it on my see. Do I look like a person that fasts every other day to you? I hate fasting. And that's the whole point of fasting. If you say, oh, I love fasting, you lost the plot. <laughs> Ezra 8.21, beside the Ahava River, I asked the people to go without eating and to pray. We humbled ourselves and asked God to bring us and our children safely to Jerusalem with all of our possessions. Folks, these people wanted a blessing on their family and on their property. And so they fasted and prayed. And some demons will only go with fasting. That's why the disciples, they were like me, they liked to eat. They sometimes didn't have authority and they'd run to Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, that demon wouldn't listen to us. And Jesus would just say, go and it would go. Was Jesus knew to fast. Do you think he enjoyed fasting? I'm sure not. Fasting is a laying down of the flesh. Uh, <coughs> when I read this, beside the Ahava River, because folks, I like to use Ahava Dead Sea products on my little bit of hair that I've got left. <laughs> and I always buy my wife shampoo and um, conditioner uh, when I'm in Israel because it's the best in the world. Um, and if I'm very sweet to her, she might let me use a little bit. But this Ahava River was uh, in Babylon. It's not in Israel. I looked it up on the map. So I, I, what I want to do today, I want to proclaim a 21-day fast for this church. Because there's some blockages that not even the courts of the Lord is unstopping it. Okay? There's some demons. Folks, there, there is addictions in the church that have just been there for too long. Okay? People struggling with addiction. We want to see that broken by the power of the name of Jesus. We want to see families restored. We want to see families healed. And some of this can be tough, eh? It can be tough. It's not easy stuff I'm talking about. You can be cut so deep 
by a family member that it's a real live wound. So today, I declare starting Monday, 21 day fast. Now don't panic on me folks. I will not make 21 days. I can tell you. Because I just told you I hate fasting. But I'm going to start a 21 day fast. And we see where the Lord leads. And when I can't anymore, then I'm going to that Daniel fast green stuff. And maybe you just decide in your heart today, well, I can only do one day because I'm very busy at work and <clears throat> it's between you and God. But if there's a problem in your home, if there's a problem in your family, if there's a problem in your finances and we've taken it to the court of the Lord and the problem persists, then we must cast out that demon with authority. We need to fast. And cast it out, we will. Folks, while I'm preaching right now, I sense the devil is having a panic attack. Because his days are numbered. This church will be full of the glory of the Lord. And those bondages in the church, they hinder the flow of the glory. So we have to deal with them. We have to root them out. And you don't root them out by chasing people away. You root them out by loving people, praying for them until they see their breakthrough. Not giving up on them. If you're that religious one and you say, I love fasting, then please don't fast because it serves no purpose. The very point of fasting is that it's a battle. If it's not a battle for you, then you're probably addicted to caffeine or something and you're drinking too much coffee and you don't need food and you're probably as thin as a rake anyway. <laughs> the very point of fasting is it must be a battle. Fasting trains you to, come, to overcome every other addiction in your life. If you're struggling with a pornographic addiction or... So, uh, a substance addiction. That nicotine, if you don't get that nicotine, you're going to die. You won't die. I promise you. And if you do, we'll raise you from the dead. Don't be anxious. But you don't go and fight the cigarette. You go and fast. Because it teaches you to have power to overcome. Okay? Okay? I want to tell you, this church has everything and everyone that it needs to succeed. God has just been blessing us. God is good to us. God is bringing people around us that are just a blessing. All we need now is to touch heaven and release the power of God in the earth. That's what God's called us to do. Will you be one of those that will push through with us and touch heaven? I, I, don't, I can't say this, sorry Diana, I can't say this in English because it's so much more powerful in Afrikaans. He komadan. <laughs> Something is about to happen. Breakthrough is our portion. We're just dealing with the keys that will lead to breakthrough. Do you know who your spiritual father is? If he asks you something, will you at least have a good answer? Today I want to move in an anointing, making declarations in the spirit over this church and over your lives. I want to call people forth into their calling. You see, if everybody <coughs> is fulfilling their God-given purpose, folks, then this church 
will become great in this city. Jesus only had 12 people. Got more than 12 people here today. You don't need a lot of people. You just need people that will see eye to eye with you. And when you give them an instruction, they went, I don't think I can do that, Pastor. God, have mercy on your soul. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and help me. And we're going to trust God for a bit of a prophetic flow this morning.